meeting to order and uh, roll into the administrative section of the agenda. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, call for any any additions that aren't currently represented on the agenda that's been circulated and warned. No. Um, oh, you know what? I'd like to just get a quick re report on the fire department if you don't mind. At uh, some point. Sure. Yep. So uh, at the end of the administrative uh, section, we'll just kind of report on that and give an update on it. Okay. Just kind of what the status is. But sure. Um, that sounds good. Um, would anybody would like to uh, make a motion to approve the minutes from June 24th? So moved. Second. Uh, any further discussion or changes that like to be offered? Oh. Sorry, I shouldn't second. I was absent. I'm abstaining. I'll second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No? Uh, thank you. Um, a vote to uh, approve the board orders. So, uh, board orders uh, were circulated and posted to the shared folder. Hopefully, everybody's had a chance to review. Were there any questions uh, about the board orders? Not any of those. Is there a motion to approve the board orders, orders as posted? So, and to sign that. I'll second. All right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Um, approving the hiring of uh, Adeline and Grace uh, as the 2024 uh, swim instructors as recommended by the swim committee and they had some applications in the, uh, in the share drive as well. Uh, does anybody have any questions about those or I don't know. <laughs> Daniel, Daniel do you want to speak, to this, no. add any additional words or field questions? I don't think so. We're pretty excited about them. Yeah. Great. It's always a major coup when we find some instructions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. Uh, so uh, I entertain a motion to, uh, to approve both applicants. So moved. Second. And any further discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, motion carries. Uh, accepting donations for uh, the Lakes and Streams uh, newsletter. I believe this is kind of part of a clarification that we uh, received or? No, this is um, going back to before you hired me, you devised a plan with the committee about their printed newsletter where you contributed 750 out of the operating budget and they promised to fundraise a certain amount, which is the, the amount that you, know, you need to approve in terms of donation. And then the balance is coming out of their uh, reserve fund. Okay. So the amount they raised is enough that we only have to pay 750? Is that correct? correct? Yeah. Okay. And do we need to have a separate motion to accept those donations in the general fund or does, uh, and then allocate those because we had some kind of dialogue around how that works. We're just going to accept them into the general fund and pay out of general fund. So that, that's fine. Uh, do we need specific amounts then for, for uh, any of them? Yeah. Yep. We do that. We'll just... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, those as well. Okay. $329.62. All right, so entertain a motion to accept uh, donations for $329.62 uh, to the general fund to be uh, reallocated to uh, the uh, Lakes and Streams newsletter and then have the balance covered by the budgeted $780? Um, $750. $750. Sure, so moved. Thank you, Anne. Second. Christy, second. Okay. Barbara, do you have a question? question please. Um, have, have thank you letters gone to all those donors? I, uh, we just accepted one check. I, I, I was not um, involved with the fundraising. I don't know who the individual donors Okay, is it okay with you if I check in with Noreen and see if we can get thank you letters to those donors? 
Yeah. Thank you. That'd be fine. Yeah. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? And motion carries. Thank you. Um, so authorizing the transfer uh, from the general fund to uh, to close the grant funds for yeah to eliminate the deficit. So we have two grant funds that are closed. One is the CLG Maple Corner Grant Fund. I'm still not clear what that those initials stand for. I'm certified local mm -hmm. Thank you. And the other one is the Emergency Planning Grant Fund. I know that was a grant provided by Regional Planning Commission to put together our emergency response plan. And in both cases, we're, we show a deficit. We, we spent more than we took in for the grants, which is fine. We've already spent the money. Um, but since those grants are closed, we're not expecting any more income. We might as well transfer funds from general fund into these two grant funds and close them, and then they will be zero on the due to from the board's going board. That's the recommended action. Can I by, ask, is this just a bookkeeping thing, or are these special funds? Oh, it's just a bookkeeping. It's just oh, bookkeeping. Okay. The, the money has been spent, or nothing else is going to happen from just closing the books on these two, two funds. And that requires a select board vote. Okay. I'll move to do that. <laughs> No second. Any further discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you. Books cleaned up. Stuff that, that represent the most complicated bookkeeping. Uh, <laughs> no, it doesn't no, matter. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, signing the ARPA resolution uh, that was adopted on June 24th. Is everybody uh, familiar with, uh, with that resolution uh, that, was, uh, that was adopted? It was a three-step process last time. Um, we, we, um, select, one, of the, one of the steps was the select board adopted a resolution allocating $80,000 um, uh, from the ARPA funds Eight thousand nine hundred and one um, into the general fund to cover employee compensation, and so I just forgot to bring the resolution, the physical piece of paper, and I brought it tonight so you can sign. Yeah, you don't need to do anything now. Uh, okay. Uh, so we don't need a motion at all. We'll just... Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Just a reminder to get yeah. that done tonight. Okay. We'll do, take care of all the signing out. Okay. okay. That sounds good. Um, so as a kind of a quick update on, uh, on the uh, East Montpelier uh, uh, agreement. So we uh, had a bill that was in attendance. Uh, Rose, you were there as well, I believe. Uh, uh, so both uh, select boards were represented as well as the fire department. Um, and there was a uh, good dialogue around uh, the proposed edits that uh, Anne had prepared and sent for consideration. Um, and uh, it, from, from my perspective, there was uh, kind of consensus on, on adopting those, uh, but they uh, wanted to send it to their lawyer uh, to uh, just have a once over essentially of that. And so the feedback from, uh, from their lawyer was that uh, it's a really messy document and they had some pretty substantive uh, changes. Uh, and so, uh, the plan at the moment, I think, is to, well, it's not a plan, it is what I'm planning on doing, but um, I'm going to reach out to the East Montpelier Select Board uh, just to kind of get a sense on, uh, on what their uh, reaction and kind of expectations are for, for that um, to see if, if that goes beyond what they're trying to work through. Uh, but because they were so significant, I didn't think it was, it was appropriate to kind of bring it up and, uh, and have everybody uh, to go through. I think there's still like one more round of dialogue um, to be had uh, with, uh, yeah. with the select board. East Montpelier Select Board volunteered to have their attorney make the edits. Review, and it ended up being maybe a bigger process. And rather than burden you with a draft that may, may or not, may not be supported by their select board, we just let them work on it and bring it to us what they will. Okay. Yeah, uh, but in general, the report is that everybody was was pretty well on the 
we were all on the same page about the intentions of the of the edit and, and wanting to clean that up, make clarification, and, and kind of st stabilize the dialogue around and, it. And even beyond the specific language, the idea of having stability. Yeah. These three right. entities right. want this thing to continue for as long as possible. We don't want contract language that could undermine us in the future. So right. that was a great bit of agreement about that. Yeah. Uh, so more more on that uh, in, in the very near future, I'd say. Uh, once, once we continue to kind of debrief on that, but um, oh, lost the agenda. Uh, so at this point, I'd open it up to public comment. Is there anybody attending from the public that um, would like to make a comment on anything other than uh, what's already uh, listed as an agenda item? Greg, are you beavers? Beavers. Yep. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, um, so we'll move past that and we'll uh, roll into an update from, uh, from Daniel on the uh, school district. Where do you want us? Oh, as close as possible. <laughs> and if you would mind, uh, just for the ORCA recording, giving a, uh, an introduction. Thanks for having us. I'm Dan Dottini. I'm one of the three representatives from the town of Callis on the Washington Central Unified Union School District Board. And I'm Diane Nichols Fleming, uh, the Burlington rep, one of the Burlington reps on the board. And we're here, hopefully, to um, share a little bit of our process that we're midstream with um, to undertake a, a study to determine if there are any better configurations for our school district out there. Um, for those who aren't aware, our school board started this process, I guess, October or November of last year. Uh, we charged one committee um, and really a, a smaller study group to examine some possible um, different simulations for what what our district's configuration could be. That includes school closures, possible school closures. It also includes um, consolidation of grades at different schools, um, and and really any other sort of different structure uh, of organization that might might benefit students in the district. Um, we received, I think, in March or April, um, as a board, the results of that survey, or excuse me, that study. Um, there were three sort of possible recommended changes that were put out there at that point, and those are sort of the only options thus far on the table. Um, two of those include closing Cal's, probably Cal's Elementary and probably Worcester. Cody Elementary. Um, the third option is moving sixth graders over to um, U32 Middle School um, rather than having them in each of the individual elementary schools. Um, so again, those are the three options on the table. And uh, we entered sort of a period of public comment immediately. Well, the plan was to do it immediately following town meeting day, and then we have a little bit of a hiccup there. And things got moved out a little bit. Um, in fact, initially, we were thinking of recommending one possible configuration to go forward with in June, and felt, based on uh, our budget difficulties and other factors, mainly input from a lot of um, voters and families in our district, that a longer period of public input and discourse was appropriate. So our, our working timeline is um, to consider adoption of a possible configuration in September um, and to warn it for consideration by voters in the affected towns, towns affected by closure in November. Um, so that's our working timeline. I guess a couple things we want from, from you all. Um, one, we're curious about how a possible closure of an element of the elementary school in 
house affects our town's plans. Um, and also, if, if there are any formal discussions among you or anyone else in, in the town of Calus government about sort of how you might use the facility if it, if it worked well as a school, um, maybe we'll start with those two questions. Also, obviously, available to answer any questions we're able to. We're two of 14 members currently on the board, so we can't exactly speak with the authority of the board, but um, factual questions, of course, and we can also bring back to the board comments, questions, concerns. And do I need permission to speak? <clears throat> Since I'm not a town Please. member? Just to get it. <laughs> okay, just wanted to make sure. Depends how rowdy the comments are going to be. We start to get pretty formal pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, do you want to offer anything else? I, I, I mean, uh, so I, for me, I guess an important clarification would be just a, a better understanding of, of what role you know, the select board plays or the town plays in, in facilitating um, the identification and uh, of, of what the final option is. It sounds like there's still a recommendation forthcoming from the board um, and, and there'll be another meeting, a public meeting on that that's that's driven by the board, right, for the, for Cal specifically or um, yeah. So is each one of the communities, I guess, once there's a recommendation, each one of the communities will then get a, uh, a, a public meeting uh, to kind of give feedback on that? Is that my understanding? That's our working plan, yeah. And so for those who might not be aware, we held community forums in each of our towns on June 26th. Got a lot of constructive feedback about both our process and possible concepts to consider. Uh, when we had an online forum last week, um, got additional feedback. We're meeting on July 17th as a board, as, excuse me, as a configuration committee um, to consider that feedback, determine what if any other models are, are, we're able to consider and are worth considering. Um, and also to reconsider our process and our timeline and make sure that that's still is the best timeline and process. Um, but yeah, I think the working plan would be if, if we were to adopt the plan with effective towns, particularly with closure, that we would have additional presentations, in-depth presentations about what that would look like in all of its aspects. Because um, we did reverse engineer, basically looking at if there needed to be a November vote, what sets for when the board would make a recommendation and that's where September came to. Mm. Right. Intuitively we wanted high voter turnout so people would have a say in this process who wanted to say. November and town meeting day are the two logical times to do that, but if we were to wait until town meeting day, a transition would probably be drawn drawn out another year, another school year. Mm -hmm. That wasn't something we were yet ready to consider. Mm -hmm. So I was, I've been out of the country, so I was unable to attend some of those meetings. Do, can you, can somebody tell us a little bit about what you heard at the Callis meeting? What did the community say? Sure. Yeah. Um, we had about 20 people in attendance. Um, and there was definitely some concern about the board not have the school board not having enough information to make the decision yet. I and mean, a lot of people weighed in on additional information related to demographics, additional information related to uh, potential toxic materials in all facilities in the district, um, additional information related to the economic impact on the town in many respects, everywhere from uh, tax bills to grand list to um, other economic effects that escape my mind. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's notable that every parent in attendance at that meeting was supportive of a merger. 
with um, another school. East Montpelier being the likely one. Um, the parents in attendance, I think there were five or six families represented. And um, those folks spoke to sort of a lack of opportunity and a lack of sort of a critical mass in the classrooms that they were seeing adversely affecting their students in terms of social and emotional learning. Um, so that was sort of what struck me. The thing I keep wondering about is, is the littlest ones, sending them all the way over to Berlin. And, and people talked about the transportation, particularly of the very young ones, and what are the thoughts there? So there is a, you know, there, those were, are some of the specific questions that we are receiving is what are the transportation costs, what is the transportation plan, what does it really look like um, for all of these, like what is the classroom configuration. Um, one of the, there's a lot of questions when you consider Berlin as an early ed center, mm -hmm. there's a, a lot, and they, Berlin would also have to vote because that's a change of use as well. And so, um, so I think that um, we understand and respect that it takes a long time to get these answers to these questions. And we have been told that by August, many of the specifics around our questions will be addressed and answered. And I think a lot of my sense is from all the towns is we're, we're waiting to see what that looks like when we see the more specifics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't, uh, I wasn't able to attend that particular meeting, but you know, I, I think I can understand it kind of from, from both angles uh, because I'm a parent and my, uh, my daughter is four and a half. And so uh, the, I, I would say the challenging and frustrating side um, is, is, is understanding that the administrators of the, of the school uh, have a really hard time uh, allocating resources definitively um, around the early ed, um, just because they don't have a clear view of who, who can attend and when, and that leaves a lot of ambiguity uh, for family, family planning pretty late into the school year when you're having to cobble together you know, part-time care or, or what have you. So, putting the schools in, in a position where um, the, those student bodies are more consolidated um, and, and that planning can be done with a little more confidence, I think, makes makes a lot of sense. Um, I, the uh, four, I, I guess I'd call them the, the plans or options that were circulated uh, a few weeks ago. Um, uh, we're all really interested in, interesting and, and seem to look at it from a couple of different options and, and I would hope that the feedback from the community was that there was a lot of work put into those and weighing a lot of considerations. I, it seems to me as a community there's a path forward where the town uh, ab absorbs the school as, as an asset for the community and can be used and, and maybe that's something that we can use for, it was pretty clearly defined in, in those contingencies. Uh, that that there's a path for the communities to uh, to look for uh, local independent partners for running some of the early ed instead of uh, instead of that having like for the pre K to get absorbed by the school district um, and that could be an opportunity to keep it more local in those buildings that are then owned by the by the community it would just require. It required a town, I guess, for managing that relationship between the local service providers and uh, and the building as an asset. But um, it's as close to a cake and eat it too situation as I could see in the path forward. But just in case anyone on the select board doesn't know, the town has the first right to buy the school should it not be a school anymore. If it would be a dollar. It's in the land record, so that's the procedure that happens if it ceases to be a school. Yeah, you know, I think. Worth noting that I think Calus is in a uniquely good position. We've got a building that is paid for and in reasonable shape, but I I would have a question for sure about uh, about what the uh, what the liability would be uh, to the town for uh, complying with the regulation around um, contaminated materials. Um, that would be, it, 
another clarifying question, I guess, would be whether that's the town whether that's the town's decision. It was my understanding that the uh, that the community would have to vote uh, to approve uh, the acquisition for for a dollar, right? So mm -hmm. we'd facilitate that vote, but it would be the the town's the town and voter base's decision, right? I'm not sure about that. Oh, okay. I don't think our articles of agreement speak to that point. I oh, okay. That probably was, was a decision on the town side. On the town side. <laughs> okay. Craig? Um, yeah, I'm Craig Line. Um, and this is all very hard for me. Daniel, I apologize for coming down on your time. It's about the um, But I just wanted to call a spade a spade. Uh, my daughter went to school, K through six. Um, I, I served on committees. Uh, I was not on the school board, but I was the school district moderator for quite a number of years and spent a lot of time in school board meetings. And um, when the, the unification came up, we all that were involved at the time had had a hard time swallowing that, and as did Worcester. I don't need to recount all this, but the main points were, we have no debt, we have a wonderful facility, we have a wonderful school community, um, we, we had a string of wonderful principals, and, and you know, class sizes were starting to dwindle, even then, my daughter's fifth and sixth grades were combined, um, but there were on average 14 or 15 kids per grade. Um, and so my first question is, what is it now? What, what, how many students are there per grade at Cal's? Now, I know enrollment has gone way down since I was involved. That's a good question. I don't have, so each, each year we're presented with a memo from the superintendent um, that presents the statewide edu education quality standards for what the target range for classrooms is supposed to be. It also presents what our district's classroom range is, and it also uh, presents a target class size, one for, I think, pre-K to third grade and one for fourth grade and up. Um, if you bear with me for just one moment, I may have... I actually downloaded the document where you have that. And I think it just has the total. Right? No, it, it says K through them. 3 in Calus, the average is 13. 4 through 6, the average is 21, which they say is 37% of the capacity as defined by the whatever that standard is. That's not grade size, though. That's class Those size. Class that's right. class size. Because okay. my, yeah. my fifth grader last year was in a five or six class of, I think, 16 or 17. And my third grader was in a class in the low 20s, maybe 23 or 24, and that was also a combined class. Mm -hmm. So, so per 15 grade to 23 is... per combined class would get you 7 to 12 per grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's kind of what yeah. And what Jordan and I actually are in the same boat where we're, our daughters are looking at a, a classroom next year, uh, two preschool class, pre, two pre K classes, two pre K grades, along with the kindergarten. So three, three class years all combined in one classroom with one, one instructor. So we're we're almost at the point <laughs> in some cases. And the fluctuation is significant year to year, where um, where even two doesn't, you know, you're not able to reach a critical mass with, with two. Um, okay. My other question is, is do I understand correctly that the voters of Callis, by ourselves, would need to approve this change? It's not co-mingled votes no. this time. That's what I thought. That's right. Yeah, thank you. And on that same note, is this, it, depending on which configuration comes forward, either two towns, Callis and Worcester, or three towns, Callis, Worcester, and Berlin, Berlin would have to approve. Is that, is, 
is this sort of an all or nothing plan? Or is there a world in which it passes some towns and not others and there's partial, you might not right. even know that. Right, yeah, I mean, that's that's the tricky part that what we're finding out. Right. And that was what some of the feedback was. You know, I think the conversation would have looked different if the budget hadn't gone down because I think right. we would have been in the communities a little sooner with a focus around this conversation. Um, but we've been, we did the June 26th forum was really around hearing what our community's creative ideas might be. Yeah. Um, and so that's, as Daniel said, when we meet on the 17th, looking to see if anything's viable that might change it up. Um, and again, it is it is that really murky area where, say, one town votes it, but the other towns don't. Then what's the, uh, right. you know, the, assim the assimilation? And then also, what do we, what if they all go down? Then what is our budget look like? So there's there's a lot of. And then I did I understand the language correctly in in the document? It seems like the scenario where uh, there's consolidation, two schools close, uh, and then uh, Berlin is used as the early ed. Uh, Berlin not only does it have to accept it, and the towns then have to accept the schools, but Berlin specifically then also has to agree after that to uh, to use their facility for early ed or dedicate their facility to early ed? So, I mean, so there's a there's a lot of things. So my work outside of the board yeah. is as an early ed person. So there are huge parts to that that have to happen. So there's an external uh, RFP that would go out and yeah. request for proposals around who would manage that because it wouldn't be managed by any of the town or school or anyone. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge lot of packets of that. I do know that we also looked at um, one of the ideas too was, um, con you know, consolidating to um, East Montpelier and Berlin and Romney in the, the pre-K stays there so that they become pre-K to five with six graders going to U32. So that's another option that it has been out there. Just to answer your question, I'm not aware of any formal consideration of what CALS would do with that building mm -hmm. or any discussion of the process that we would use to figure that out. I've been part of plenty of conversations about, you know, brainstorming. Wouldn't that be nice? But um, uh, given, given what uh, opportunity is, but also given what a responsibility it would be to take on that building. And the fact that you're gonna be making, or this decision is gonna be made ideally by November, it's hard to know how we would engage with that before that decision is made. Right. It's like speculative to have a conversation about how do we use this building if we don't even know if the vote's gonna pass. So I guess one question to add to your list is, how quickly would you need a decision for that right of first refusal? Like how, how many months would, the town of Callis or Worcester have to let you know if they're going to take on that. Well, yeah, I guess more to that point and relative to the clarification that it would be the legislative body making that decision um, for that it would be helpful to know what those associated costs are going to be. Um, in, or just, even if it were an estimate, it, it would what would be our maintenance costs uh, or potential liabilities for contaminated materials, that sort of thing, you know, because we'll need to be yeah. able to make potentially in fairly short order uh, a, a pretty rapid, and we didn't need to make an informed decision and it would be time be time consuming to yeah, try so to suss that out. Sort of baseline data that you can provide to us. Sort of like a sales sheet, but you're, you're trying to yeah. for a dollar. Sell the school. <laughs> and, and what what does happen? So say uh, the town says no, thank you. Right. What's where does it? That's your asset to, to do what you want with. Oh uh, yeah, I would, uh, that, and that uh, yeah, another clarification that that's what I'm assuming that it would be it would be absorbed uh, by the school district to decide what to do with it, right? Um, to either sell or use or continue to pay for clean them. up. Clean up. <laughs> I would, yeah. Yeah. Um, One other aspect to if the town was considering whether or not to buy it, 
would be another whole round of RFPs right. for potential right. tenants or users or programs. I mean, just so many balls of wax. That and I do think we would have a baseline. So basically, it's a baseline of carrying costs is mm -hmm. what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And I, I do believe that it has been requested as what is the cost to run each building. And so um, that is one of the concrete things that we've asked for, and I believe that could easily be translated into. Yeah, I think that just the, yeah, the line items from the budget would be pretty informative on that, right. on that particular element. And, and we also have a five-year capital plan that's broken out by school. So we have sort of what was in our, on our radar for five years of maintenance and uh, infrastructure replacement. Yeah. Um, so that would add to it. Yeah. Right, any other questions? Well, like, I, I was just going to move on and respond to your other questions. You were asking for feedback about your process and how you're presenting this. Yeah, and then I think it's really a, a, a really important question to us is if from the town perspective we're missing key questions that we're not asking. Um, also, any recommendations you have to improve our deliberative process in terms of um, more transparency, I guess, or potentially um, Questions around oh, just escaped me. And then this. Yeah, that's what I mean, that's what we were hoping for. I think um, outreach, we're we're always curious and interested to know if there are ways we can reach populations who aren't yet feeling like they can access this conversation. Um, just sort of a million dollar question in the twenty first century. Or, there are some obvious ways of communicating with sort of um, the civic public, but there are, there are less obvious ways to reach those people who are less, less already engaged. And I think also what we're learning from, um, at least from conversations with Dodi and others, of the unintended consequences, so, you know, which was that original question of did you have plans, you know, Town plans that included maintaining a building, or you know, what are those? Are there any unintended um, impacts if, if we move forward with that? I mean, I found the summary sheet really informative. Uh, by the time you got into the uh, the options. Uh, Occasionally, I got a little bit lost in, in some jargon on the abbreviations. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it was clear to me that plenty of analysis was going into it relative to um, good good data. Uh, I would just say be sensitive of the jargon. And, and I think that in any of these situations, it's going to be hard. Do you want to try to give as much participation and transparency as possible? And there's, I think there's only so much effort, clarity that can be uh, that can be provided. But I, you know, I think any any documents like this that are easily consumed that we can publicize on the on the website or, or leave on the website or make available through the town resources would be would be pretty appropriate. Um, you know, I, I I don't know that that would have been appropriate until there is a, a solid recommendation. It would just be too many too many options and too many. Uh, hypotheticals to to kind of chew on, um, but certainly as we get closer to that vote, it would be good to have something like that to put on the website. Um, I think it's important to remember that not all parents have a college education and yeah. cannot always easily digest what's being put in front of them. So yeah. Don't just preach to the choir. Yeah. So to speak. There, there is also ongoing a, a, a at the planning commission a process to update the town plan, and they'll be talking about education in that plan, and they would be involved in you know uh, developing a vision for the future. It seems to me they they would be people to have conversations with at least, mm -hmm. no matter what they want to put in the plan. But one criticism that I think 
we've heard um, that's, I think, worth responding to is that um, this process is intended primarily to save money. And I think, well, I, don't, I, I, I know I can't speak for the board, but I guess we, you know, we identify four important priorities um, to optimize class size for good instruction, um, to maintain full-time nursing and counseling in the schools, to expand enrichment opportunities, and to limit and share, limit or eliminate shared use or shared positions across multiple buildings or very, very small FTE positions um, because of the size of a, a student body in a given school. We didn't, we didn't include anything in cost because I think for us, my sense is that for us, the bar is very high. If we're asking a, a town to close a school, there had better be really positive outcomes. And the advantages and better outweigh the disadvantages. And in order to do that, it's, I could see a scenario in which, yes, there's cost savings from closing schools, but that's all reinvested in you know, these enrichment opportunities we're speaking of. And, you know, robust counseling services in the school, and so on and so forth. Um, I think beyond the bounds of our school district, another potential opportunity represented might be the town's reuse of a facility. And I think that's one of the reasons we ask that question, is because we all want to understand all the sort of uh, dimensions of, of the impact of the decision, positive and negative. So I hear, I hear what you're saying, but it's, it's an unwieldy thing to bring up before it's a real possibility, and yet it's also never too soon, I think, to start the conversation, at least informally. We're going to have to try to give people a sense of what the budget, budgetary impact of this is as soon as possible, but we don't know that yet. Well, that would be important to understand. I mean, you're saying you'll save the money and you'll be able to reinvest, but I haven't seen any numbers that actually convinced me of that. Yeah, well, and again, I don't feel as if we're in a position to convince anyone because we don't know if we would save any money. I mean, we have a sense from our capital plan. Cut me off. Um, we have a sense from our capital plan of what we would spend in the next five years in any given facility. We have a sense of the instructional costs in each building and in that initial study that they, we, we were given this spring the administration sort of laid out those savings and it, it roughly resulted in some about a million dollars in savings a little less than a million dollars in savings and, annually. And you put those, publish those anywhere? Yep. So, and, and oh, that's, okay, so I missed them. Right, well, and that's part of the tension. So, you yeah. know, we know that it's been this perfect storm of the legislature and, and this confusing way of funding. Yeah. We know that there's this tension between um, um, how do we maintain a sustainable option that also provides for these priorities. And yet, also, then, what does that look like? And um, one of the things I heard at the forum that I led was really, there are some other priorities we need to be looking at. And one is transportation. What is that impact on transportation for kids? And then also just the other, the impact on the, the community as a whole. And too. the cost of transportation yes. as compared to yes. what you exactly. said. Right. right. And, and the reality, you know, what we, also have been hearing is that unless we can really present some concrete information for people to understand, it's a big change to ask a community to go through if we can't really understand the funding or mm -hmm. what's potentially going to happen in the legislature. Mm -hmm. So that, that's also the tension of what we're trying to balance as we, as we go through this and respecting what communities are saying but also understanding what we've heard from others as well about the lack of sustainability for you know, income. 
I, I think that's that's always going to be a moving target. And, you know, it, it's uh, every year that goes by, things get more expensive, and it's always going to be hard to project what the theoretical expenses are going to be for maintaining a consolidated one, as opposed to the projected cost of maintaining a, uh, a, a one that de dedicated in the town. I, um, I, I think, yep. Just wanted to add another, a number of teachers have left the school this year and some of them left because they had to, but some of them left because they were afraid that their job wasn't going to be around. So we're going to have the additional cost of retraining every year that we don't consolidate because people will be figuring out of losing their jobs and yeah. lose quality educators. So the second half of my comment there, I, that's a, a good, great point. And I, you know, I think that kind of goes to that ambiguity. The longer uh, process is more ambiguous, uh, the, the more painful it gets and the more obscure it gets. Um, um, but you know, pivoting a little bit to better understanding the decision to absorb uh, the facility as a community asset, um, uh, I think it would be important for explaining to folks uh, from the perspective of the town, you know, we, we've been having other independent conversations about need for uh, supplemental or new uh, town garage facility or premises um, or uh, additional administrative space. Um, we have community centers that are old, restored, beautifully restored buildings, but they have their own logistical challenges and constraints relative to their use. Um, and uh, it is extremely expensive to purchase the property and build from scratch um, if the town were to look at trying to stand up a, a, new, a new building. So even though as a school it is getting on uh, getting on in its years um, it is still substantially newer um, than uh, than some of the other community centers that we utilize um, uh, and and some of them fairly acutely when we're in periods of uh, regional distress relative to floods uh, emergency response centers etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, uh, i found the first rate refusal document the Second bullet point says the town may exercise its option to purchase the subject premises within one year of receipt of written confirmation from the district that they're not using it. So according to this document, we have a year. We could always negotiate something else, but according to this, that's what we have. There's also a bullet that says, for its part and as partial consideration for the district granting the town an option to purchase the subject premises, the town covenants and agrees that for so long as it is economically practical, it will endeavor to maintain the subject premises for community, civic, and public use. Right. right. And, and to answer your question, um, just to, I, I shared a slideshow configura configuration options for the full board. On slide 31, uh, there's a, a, a sheet that offers the potential cost savings. Is that one of the ones that you list as the three documents? I think so. Okay. Do you, do you remember which one? I can't. Oh, here it is. Frequently asked questions, strategic plan, and configuration study preliminary findings. Is it one of those? It would be the configuration the, yeah, the Okay, the configuration, configuration study. Okay. Yes. Slide 23, you said? 31. 31. Another quick question is, have, has the board contacted or discussed with any other districts, either in Vermont or elsewhere, that have gone through this? And I, I do realize I'm hearing you, Jordan, say things keep changing more quickly than we can predict. But the state of Maine consolidated their schools, and just a few years later, districts were divorcing, and it didn't work. They didn't save money. And I cried this song so I was blue in the face to committees at the legislature and to meetings here, and it got it happen. And so I understand the flip side is a planning enrollment and what to do um, and providing a quality education. But I'm just wondering if you have learned anything from anybody else's travails. Not to my knowledge, I know some other folks are in a very similar 
place as we and are going through the same deliberations, but I don't know if any of them have recently done something like this or considered something like this. The question that usually comes up is Montpelier. And yeah. we started those conversations with Montpelier. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, to, is there any other dialogue that I think need to be worked through um, or, or questions that we should touch on in the document? But I don't think so. I mean, I, I think we would like to emphasize that we're an open door and would love to sort of have this be the start of ongoing conversation. Um, we'll do our best to keep you updated as a body um, of what, what changes are made and what progress is made, especially in so far as it affects you and the town of Dallas. Um, but stay tuned for probably another, another, rain, another round of community forums either in August or September, I imagine. And one of the, you know, as a Berlin person on the board, it is still my role to represent as best I can people from Calais and um, Worcester and uh, East Berlin. You know. So it, it's important for me to hear and for you to also know that um, I am trying to be open to what I'm hearing um, and, and just be reflective of that as best I can. Thank you, um, and, and thanks for um, thanks for all the work. Yeah. A lot of work. It's it's a lot of work. Um, thank you. Just switch back to the agenda. Uh, so we've. Beavers, uh, yep. Uh, plan to address the Kent Hill uh, Road Beaver activity. Uh, Kari, do you want to yes. kind of give a status update on recent meetings? So and the day after our last meeting, a group of us met with Tyler Brown, the beaver specialist in the state, we took a look at the situation and basically said we have two options: you can go the baffle route or the trapping route. And I tried to, as neutrally as possible, present to you those two options and the implications of both. Um, I can say I've heard from a number of people, including in this room, who you know, presented different um, preferences. Uh, I'd say I've heard from more people who prefer the baffle route, um, with the typical thing, uh, reason being it's worked before, and uh, it offers potentially a longer term solution since trapping is there's no guarantee that it will be in the same place in the year later. Um, from a, on the other hand, I heard from a couple of people that that risk of the beaver, beaver dam breaking and um, is, you know, there's a significant risk. I, I don't know how likely that is or how likely that would result in damage to property. Um, it's also hard to, um, it's, it's just a hard thing to gauge. So sort of a risk uh, cost benefit analysis. That's, um, not very precise, but I'll try to lay it out for you as best I can. So, questions? Yeah, what about the potential for um, both? <laughs> Putting the beaver baffle in, monitoring, and then if it turns out that it's not working well, moving to the trapping option. Yeah, I don't see why that couldn't be. Um, yeah. Great. If the sort of the best practice is trapping would happen in the fall mm -hmm. then and baffle could happen in within yeah. a month mm -hmm. and baffle doesn't cost us anything that seems like um, so the history of that particular beaver dam we did uh, put a baffle in about two and a half years ago six six years ago yeah a long time ago <laughs> time gets away from this. I'm yeah. as old as I look. Um, and it worked. It kept the, the level of the waters down. Um, the problem was the beavers then abandoned it because they didn't like the low water level. 
which was a good thing, but the problem was the state owned the baffle and Tyler realized that it wasn't necessary anymore, so he came and removed it. So if we do put a baffle in, we should purchase the materials ourselves and maintain it ourselves. We do have beaver baffles in, in Adamant Village, the beaver dam there, and it's been working for many, many years. So um, it probably is a good solution. The other thing you can do is you can do a little bit of lowering of the, of the dam before you put the baffle in, so you can actually lower, not significantly, but maybe a foot or two of the retained water before you put the baffle in, and that would then help the, right now the water level is at the top of the culvert, so if any water comes in, it's going to essentially um, start eroding the road, because essentially the standing water right there now is, is way high. And it probably needs to be at least dropped by a foot or two foot at, at, the, at the very minimum for that culvert. Yeah, so for me, it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, there, there are layers, uh, layers to this, and, and my, my read on most of the sense, uh, m most of the sentiments involved are that the first preference is always to try to use some sort of baffle uh, trapping that uh, kind of respects the life of the, uh, of the critter trying to make a home there. Um, but, you know, I think there's also kind of a risk assessment and response time element of this as well. Um, and uh, one of the barriers is that we don't own the baffle and uh, we don't install them. We rely on outside resources for them, but we've got plenty of need for the use of them around town. Um, and it would make sense to have our own and have them installed in areas where where they need to be uh, where they need to be used. So, so I think Tyler would do the installation because he has the experience. It's just a question of the material. Material. If I could, could speak to some of this, um, only because some of what you said is true and valid, and some isn't accurate. Because Tyler came, and we had a meeting there, and I can fill you in on that. If, if I could. Uh, I, but I feel pretty pretty well up to speed on that. And well, the, but he, he said a few things, and, and I think Toby's in favor of the battle, so I'm not trying to argue against you, Toby, but he just spoke up sure. and said a couple things that aren't actually quite true. Okay, well, take a stab at clearing okay. those up then. So um, I've got um, uh, a document here which I can submit so you all can read it if you don't come to a, a resolution tonight. Tyler uh, came back and told us that he removed the baffle because the beavers had left. Um, he didn't say that it was because the water level was too low for them. He did say that he thinks he could drop the water level down by about a foot. When I last looked at it, and it was before this heavy rain we just had, there was about a foot of clearance um, from the top of the water to the bottom of the bridge. It's actually a bridge, they're concrete. Yep. And so he said he, he would feel comfortable lowering the level about a foot from where it was on June 25th. And, and that was a full foot of clearance. Um, he, he kind of makes a notch in the dam and then installs the pipe up and over the dam. On the uphill, deep water side, there's a cage that is submerged mm -hmm. and held down with cement blocks. Um, he's, I asked him about cost, and this time around, because the last time the town bought the culvert, the state provided the cage apparatus and paid for Tyler's time. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you paid for the pipe the last time around, and so I'll provide all the materials. Now, his sense was the beavers left because the water was too low. So, and if new beavers came in, it's been his experience that they could well plug a baffle existing at the site because they aren't used to what it does. He's had better luck with installing a baffle on a dam where there are active beavers. Um, so, so are you arguing that a baffle would be ineffective at no, that site? I'm, I'm staunchly in favor of the baffle. It, it worked for maybe four years. He can't remember exactly when he took it out. 
and I didn't notice. I just all of a sudden noticed it was gone. I didn't know when he removed it or why. Um, and so it, I think it's a different configuration, and correct me if I'm wrong, Toby or uh, Kari, than what is in Adam. And yes, it's true. There's a huge washout, but the dams over there are holding back way more water than this wetland. Um, it's not known what would happen if that dam was breached, but it's my understanding that a beaver dam is sounder if there are beavers there repairing it when needed. <clears throat> well, I, I appreciate that input. I think um, from, from my perspective, uh, the, the, the history of, uh, of the approach at the site is, is somewhat moot because we're living in a period of rapid change. And I think it kind of gets back to uh, a proper risk assessment and guiding kind of policy on what the preferences are going to be uh, because it's going to be site specific at, at any of the locations. And while it may be true about the uh, volume of water that's being held back in, in Adamant, there's a unique situation with a dam that's going to be under construction in uh, weeks um, and going through a period of exposure, uh, I guess, through uh, a, a period of time where we just dealt with some pretty significant flooding. So it's not just the liability of that particular organic dam being held, but it's the it's the sustainability of what happens if there's a failure further upstream of a pretty significant body of water um, in, in a short period well, of time. So, and, and to speak to that, last year when there was so much water coming down through that wetland, that beaver dam did not break, even though the, the well, I'm not sure exactly when the beavers were trapped. Um, it, it was in the summer, Kari, looked up for me, it, it cost the town $265. And it was not done according to the state's uh, preferences, the best management practices, waiting until the trapping season. So um, it, it didn't break then, and, and there's certainly less risk now that the dam is being rebuilt of the cruise on. Uh, so, Kari, I have. Uh... Do we have a price for what the cost of materials uh, would be for the uh, for installing a baffle? No, I, I haven't raised that. With Tyler. He offered to, to pay for it um, entirely this time since he took it out last time. But I could get that price. I, I imagine it's not going to be a significant expense in the highway department budget. Just to be clear, he would pay for it, and we own the materials. Uh, he, he offered to pay for the materials this time and donate his labor. Toby's suggestion, which I think is a good one, is if we're going to go with a baffle, let's pay for the materials, allow him to build it, of course, but then we wouldn't run the risk of him removing it. I'm, I'm not sure that's true. Sorry to interrupt. Because he built the baffle on the end, so those were the state's materials and his time to construct that, and then his time to come up and install it um, with help. A number of us helped do that. So I'm not, I'm not sure it would be that simple. Uh, is all I'm saying. Yeah, maybe you would reject that. Uh, yeah. It's a conversation. It's, you know, it's worth bringing up. But it seemed like a no-brainer to me when he said, well, you paid for it before. I took it out. So you know, sort of my bag, I'll pay for it, the, the materials. And he had you know, every expectation that it would work as well as it did the last thing. So how quickly uh, would we be looking at having it installed? What's his availability it, for installation? He, well, it's a good question. He said a month, two weeks ago. I don't know if, he, if I call him tomorrow, he'll say a month from tomorrow, or be available in two weeks. Um, perhaps what I could do is, if you approved it tonight, I could get him up, we could get on his calendar, I could have the conversation about the cost of materials and the ownership of the materials and bring that back to you so that if it's something that's going to cost us, you can approve it in two weeks. At, at yeah. what point does the um, dewatering of the Curtis Pond affect us? It what, what's the time period? It should that? not significantly. So the current <coughs> estimate is that they'll be working on the cofferdam a week from today. 
and then it's three or four days of construction and then dewatering would be either like Friday of that week or the next Monday. Um, but it, it's a fairly gradual process, right? They're not lowering the pond significantly. They have two pumps that pump about what the pumps we had last year, about 7,000 gallons a minute, is it? Um, but it's not pumping significantly more water than what goes over the spillway after a heavy rain on the pond side. So it, it's not, they're not looking at, if anything, over the summer, it will be less water coming through. Have I I have a question. I think the last thing that Craig just said, if I understood you correctly, was that timer said, well, you guys paid for the last baffle. I shouldn't have removed it, my bad. But Is that no, what you said? He didn't say I shouldn't have removed it. But did he say you there guys paid for the last one? Because if he, we paid for the last one and he removed it, it seems like he owes us a baffle that we don't have to pay for it here. We, 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 paid, for the com we paid for the components of the last one. but uh, yeah, Just the core. Long piece. Right, um, and, and likely reused it somewhere else. I, I'd imagine, however, however that works. But you know, I think it's kind of a moot point. I mean, I think we have a decision now to whether or not we want to uh, pursue having a, a baffle, a baffle uh, installed at the at the. There's at least an offer to have it installed at no cost uh, by the state, and then we have a later decision potentially to uh, either reach an agreement with Tyler on how much to pay if we'd like to keep it ourselves right. um, uh, at the point that it's either uninstalled or left permanently um, uh, or semi-permanently, medium term. Um, uh, and then uh, it seems to me we also need to have a little bit of a dialogue on what the contingency plan is, should there, uh, what the risk assessment is um, on how long it'll take to install and, and what our period of you know, exposure, um, not, not the actual installation of it, I'm, I'm saying the scheduling of the installation, so it sounds like it could be out to a month and um, that we may need to take some form of action before that if there is a continued increase in risk to damaging infrastructure or downstream what do you Probably, have right? Well, he's talking about lowering the water level. That would help. Yeah. Is there? Do we? Do we lower the? Do we lower the dam? You know, prior to the baffle, prior to the baffle to give the beavers some work for a month uh, before <laughs> the. You know, just to uh, give ourselves so some they cushion. They back up overnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that, that, that's what I'm talking here. Um, yeah. I did uh, so, Harvey's request. Okay. <laughs> and, and the next day it was all back and then some. Um, I, I think if you put a bath, I'm, I'm okay with the bath, but I'm also okay with the other if, if that doesn't, doesn't work. But I'd also like to see the water we get the water level as low as we can. Because it doesn't just affect what's going on there. It affects everything upstream from there. Yeah. I'm sure it could just property gets low. Mm -hmm. you know? and there's, there's snowmobile trails in there and stuff in there that we always have to deal with with much higher water than we used to. So there's other things going on. Yeah. You got a dam downstream at Robinson province in Selma. If that thing breaks, what's going to happen there? Mm -hmm. um, so. Curry, just a, a point you might ask Tyler about. As I recall, there were two sizes of culvert that could be used for this. And I don't know if it was 12 and 20 or 8 and 12. I don't remember. And, you know, I, it doesn't make sense to lobby for the larger culvert. I don't know. Or, or was it the larger one? I don't remember the details. We can evaluate our options better. But it sounds like we're heading in the direction of approving the baffle route and then the details of ownership and size and all that. Yeah, I think that, that would be that would be good. I just want to make one quick point about maintenance. And I know uh, John, the road foreman, was concerned about having to spend time, the impact on the road, valid concerns. But 
Tyler said, I will do whatever maintenance is needed. If the beavers appear to be plugging it or something, messing with it, I just need to know. And I, I go by there sometimes a couple of times a day, and others walk by. Anybody can say, hey, it looks like this is not quite right. Then we let Kari know, he lets Tyler know, and he'll come up. Yeah, I, I, I would, for me, it's, a, it's more about what the trigger point is in the evaluation, the risk assessment, and, and what the what the exposure is to the town on, on uh, uh, this is a fairly unique situation because you've got upstream dams, you've got downstream dams, uh, and then you've got uh, wetlands in between surrounded by private property that complicates things even more. You know, we've got, we do have a, a beaver policy. I think we're having a good dialogue around what, what we want to prioritize in those considerations. Um, but it, it would be helpful for the community, I think, to have a, a, a clear expectation about what the, what the transition point is. For when, when is just a, a baffle un, uh, untenable uh, relative, to the, uh, relative to the outside uh, risks um, uh, and, and costs? Um, but you know, on this particular matter, I think we have some pretty clear direction to pursue a baffle uh, installation. Uh, do we need to take a vote on that, since it's no cost to the no. town? Maybe not. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and oh, no, we'll, I'll no. just come back to you with more detail. It would be, I would like to know, I guess, from Tyler, you know, back to the, the point of a bigger culvert, you know, this is a pretty unique situation. It's a fairly dynamic relative to the, its surroundings. Um, and, you know, what is, what are our options for choosing the, the, the height of the dam and the water level so that uh, we're, we're playing a delicate balancing okay. act. But, yeah. I guess the biggest thing is when. And, and when. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very nice. I appreciate that thoughtful comment. I'm, I'm chuckling here because it's Vermont. Yeah. And I'll bet to Tyler, this is not a unique situation. Right. That no. everywhere that he's dealing with beavers all around the state, and he's the only guy he lives down in Springfield. Um, you know, it's nothing but dam after dam after dam, whether human constructed or beavers. Um, he, and did, he did say that he didn't think it was predictable to say, is this dam going to go or is it going to be okay? And, and we can't say. No, that, that's a fair point, and I'll take the opportunity to publicly plug a book called Eager. Read it, it's interesting. <laughs> it's about beavers and the ecology of beavers. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so thank, thank you, you, Craig. Uh, and Toby, thanks for the recommendation. Uh, and Kari, yeah, everyone involved. Um, Moscow Woods Bridge. Yeah, so this came up two weeks ago when we were meeting with the friends of Winooski, and then subsequent to that, I think everyone's aware of the challenges with that bridge on Moscow Woods. But I wasn't informed about, you know, the extent of the, our engineers' concerns and their recommendations to replace and, and the history of it. This is going back to at least 2014 when, right. when they originally joined up the town. Um, know that they are recommending a replacement of it. So I want to make sure you understood that since it's, it's come to me. And then uh, I think Toby can probably fill in a little bit more about, about the situation. Um, yeah, so originally in 2014, and I don't, I'm not sure if I was still on the select board or I was operations manager when that happened, but I never saw that before. Um, so essentially, 10 years ago, engineers said the bridge needs to be replaced, that it's falling apart, there's, there's problems with it. Um, I came into it in 2022 when the sinkhole appeared, and then the, there was a, an emergency situation of stabilizing the abutment. And that's when I wrote a grant to get it repaired. Um, we got a $100,000 grant, an emergency repair grant. Um, then I left employment with the town for a year and a half, and then nothing happened to follow up on that. Um, when I came back in with you guys, then I pursued it again. It's gone to engineering, so DeWolf Engineering has been working on stream permits and a, a plan to repair the failing abutment. Um, under the $100,000 grant. Um, that process is not complete yet because there's still paperwork. In the interim, we had the July flood and the dam above the bridge became um, 
damaged beyond repair, people are not going to repair it. So now the discussion is the friends of Winooski want to take the dam out. So the problem is when they take the dam out, that stream, instead of being a 15 or 20 foot stream on this side of the dam, is now a 35 foot, what they call, bankful width. So essentially, the stream, the stream that's going to come through that area is not going to be withheld by the dam and narrowed to 17 feet. So the bridge right now is only 17 feet bankful width. So in order to re replace the bridge and meet the, the missing dam issue, we'd have to make a, 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 essentially a bridge that has a 30 foot span bank to bank. Um, I've talked with Michelle uh, Braun at Friends of Winooski and she is, we're talking about trying to combine both of our needs. This is a mitigation, this would be a mitigation grant um, mm -hmm. and combine the two, I, the two projects together um, and I think that's the route we should take. So in the meantime, um, I've talked with Chris Temple at the Wolf and said, can we do a, a, a shorter term minor repair to keep the bridge in place until we then can replace it entirely, rather than spending 100,000 and then in a year or two doing a whole bridge again. Um, so he's waiting for your approval to say, let's take that route. I've also pre-applied for the hazard mitigation funds for the state saying that this is a mitigation project, project that we want to be involved in. Right now, mitigation is paying 100% instead of the 80% that it normally does. So essentially, this is the time to jump in. The one thing that I haven't cleared, and I'm not sure how it will work, is Friends of Winooski is not a municipal corporate, not a municipal entity, so they can't apply for the grants. So we would have to somehow roll that into our request as funding the dam replacement. And I think it would work because right now the stormwater project in East Calus by the post office is totally funded, no participation by the state, and we don't own that property at all. So, so a public threatened infrastructure that we can reach outside of the town um, property is an available, I believe it's an available option, but I haven't determined that yet. I've got to reach out to somebody and make sure we can make that happen. But that's where, so essentially I'm asking you guys to say, is that the plan? Put in a minor temporary fix that would last maybe two or three years and then pursue the hazardous, hazard mitigation grant for both the dam and the bridge in order to solve that problem all at once. It's the hazard mitigation grant. Um, right now we're in that, that acute period of time where they're throwing 100% at, at that with, if in, a perfect world, we already had plans for a new bridge. Would we be able to apply for a hazard mitigation with the rationale that the dam is going to be removed and it would need to well, meet the new so specifications? Essentially, essentially, we had a grant to fix the bridge yeah. in the ex existing situation. We're actually going to forego that and just take some monies from there, not use the whole grant. Um, and this is a mitigation. So replacing the bridge was not a mitigation, it was a repair. So that's an entirely different piece that we had had in place. Now we're talking about hazard mitigation. So essentially, if the dam is taken out and that stream becomes 30, 30 to 35 feet wide, if there's a flood event, it then gets choked into that 17 foot and then that threatens the infrastructure of the bridge being washed away. So essentially that's a mitigation thing. So if they replace the bridge now with the right um, bankful width, then that, that hazard disappears. And that's the uh, benefit cost analysis that they have, to, they have to perform. And again, so there's a pool of money, and I think it's $80 million that the state has for this round of hazardous mitigation at 100%. So everybody in the state of Vermont is going to apply for it. We will just be another piece in that list of people. And whether we get it or don't get it, there's no guarantee. It's not, a, it's not a done deal. It's, it's, it's like, what's the highest risk in all the state of Vermont and who gets the highest priority? Is there a time limit that you can use the money? Do we know that? Or? Uh, no, but the, um, the, the real application started in January. So essentially, we're telling them that we have projects to give the, the state emergency management a chance to see what's out there and, and do some pre-evaluation about what they're going to face. 
when the grants are issued, I don't know what the time frame is. I mean, most of my grants are a year and a half to two years to completion. So you said we're partnering with the Friends of Winooski. Does that mean we're applying for the grant that would enable them to take the right. dam so down they, so as well? They, so they, as an entity, can't get they can't apply to the mitigation grant. So we would have to say we want to include this as part of our project. But, but does that include taking the dam down? Yes. It, it does. So yes. they don't have the money to do that yet. I don't know what they have yet. No, I think they told us when they were here they had the money for the study, but they didn't go after the money for deconstruction until the study. engineering is done. Right. Um, and uh, Michelle said it was five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars to take out the dam. Dan, when they were here last time, they looked at all the different grants they could possibly apply for and what worked or what they were to sort of pick and choose and try to put the money together as they could. So they didn't have a we're applying for this grant just to give us all the money. They just seemed to feel confident that they put it okay. together. So if I'm understanding correctly, then you're suggesting we work with them to apply for a grant for both projects. I'm calling them two different projects, but they're the same project. For both projects at the same time. As they say in Geico, bundle it. Bundle it. <laughs> but you're suggesting that we go after the temporary fix and not the whole fix? Well, only because the bridge is still in, in shaky condition. And, okay. and, and we don't um, want to wait. It, so scaling back just, so essentially, um, Chris Temple said, the, the scope of what we're, we were working on was a 10 to 15 year fix. What he now is going to do is scale it back to a two to five year at the most fix to just deal with the exact hazards that are there. There's some metal beams that are unsupported and there's some, you know, just some temporary retaining issues to, to maintain the bridge in its current condition. And there are grants available for that? Well, we would use we would use the grant we already have. The one we've got. We just wouldn't use all of hundred thousand. And, 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 and I needed you to tell me, set him on that path so we can find out what that's going to be. And Do then I'll work with the state and talk to the state on the grant side and say, because we're going to replace this bridge, we're only going to use this portion of that grant money. And that's money that turns over every year if it's not used by the VTrans people. Do we need to use any of that 100,000, the original grant, to to work with the Wolf to design enough of the, well, let's call it the ideal no dam uh, bridge um, to make a compelling enough argument or an accurate an accurate enough assessment of yeah, the Yeah, I'd have to check with the state about whether or not whether or not engineering for a new bridge would fall under that emergency repair grant. Grant, the original emergency repair grant. But I, I'm not sure. I'd have to get a clarification on that before we, you know, essentially that grant getting audited would may, may or may not cover it, but I can find that out. I have a suggestion. If this grant application is going to a Vermont emergency management, that perhaps we can also tag uh, uh, Nick Yimlin's name on it since he was the Vermont Emergency Management Director of the Year. And so maybe having his name associated with that grant application might be a little bonus. We'll put everyone's name. <laughs> there you go. So, so I have a question about the dam. How, how certain is it that this dam is going to be removed? Well, I think that, the, so I, I'm working with the Friends of Anuski on another project. Okay. And so there are there are layers to these. There's like the, there's the initial identification of, of it, which they use a certain pool of resources and funding for. And then, uh, and then there's fundraising and granting, grant writing just for the scoping, which can be, you know, hun hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on how complicated it is. So my understanding, and then there's, once you've scoped it and then produced an informed design, you then have a grant process for uh, for trying to execute the work, which can be hundreds of thousands of dollars more, or you know, you know over a million dollars. And so we're in that in between phase where they've, uh, I believe, have secured funding to uh, pursue a grant work for scoping it out, but they they may not ever have the funds to remove it, even if they have a recommendation to it. And, and the scope and a design 
uh, relative to doing the work. Um, so that is that is an, yeah. a, an outside risk, but it would seem like it would make a pretty compelling argument for the hazard mitigation grant if you're bundling a bridge with whose existential uh, state is relative to the existence of a dam or not existence of a dam um, and, and, it, and its current condition. So if you have enough of a scope in design to apply for that grant to, to cover the removal. And it's really probably going to be the benefit cost analysis that they're looking at with all the other projects they're going to get in front yeah. of them. It's like, okay, so if that bridge gets washed out, how much are we going to pay for it because the dam was taken out and we didn't fix the bridge and we didn't deal with the bridge being the issue after the dam was removed. And so essentially, we're at the we're at the whim of whoever's doing the, the cost analysis of, okay, so I put in an $850,000 bridge because I had to because I... <laughs> if it washes out and I lose that road for three right. months and there's no travel through the town of Calus on one of its main thoroughfares. I mean, again, all of those things are the cost-benefit analysis that's going to decide whether or not they're going to fund, what they're going to fund. And there's, I have no inclination, one way or another, how we stand against whatever else is on the, on the horizon that they'll be looking at. So it seems to me the potential risk of deciding to go for the two to five year fix versus the 25 year fix is if we go that route and then we don't get the hazard mitigation funding, then we're not buying ourselves the buffer that we might need. Right. So so the, the look back at 2014 is, hey guys, this bridge needed to be replaced 10 years ago it's way past time that we bellied up. So it's either we get a mitigation grant and that's great and we save all that money and the state pays for it out of our own pockets, our, tax, our state tax dollars, or we write a bond and replace the bridge ourselves mm -hmm. on taxpayer dollars. And it's just one of those things. Yeah. I mean, we would have had to do that if the dam were still there. Right. We'd still have to pay for it because there was not a hazard, hazardous condition by the existing bridge. It was just falling apart. It was, you know, it was, it was at the end of its life. So, so there's, this is an opportunity that we should apply for, and if we get it, great. And if we don't, then the next step is find other resources to do the work anyways, whether or not this grant comes through. But I think we need to target that bridge for total replacement. If we do this, though, we do the bundle, the Geico bundle, whatever. Um, we then become responsible for removing the dam, the town does, correct? I'm not sure. Uh, again, right now, the, the stormwater project at the post office is completely being run by Central Vermont Regional Planning. The town has no interest, has no interaction with that. It's just funded. It's a project that was designed and is being installed eventually at Taxpayer, not our, not our dollars, FEMA dollars or whatever, stormwater dollars. And, you know, essentially it would be the same thing. This is mitigation money where we wouldn't own the dam, we wouldn't own the, we would just be the title on the grant yeah. document. Just thinking through the logistics of the financing and, and the contingencies. Uh, so if, if we've got uh, if we've got the hundred thousand dollars, we've uh, we've attributed some of that towards a design that was originally going to be a short term fix, and we're going to have them walk that back to a in term fix. That executing that in term fix, you know, cost of materials, et cetera. Does that need to come out of that hundred thousand dollars, or is that a well, again, so it's it, it, so the, the grant was to repair the repair the, repair the dam. Yeah. So whatever repair we do, I then just put in for reimbursement on what we decided. Mm -hmm. So we don't lose that money on the repair work that we're going to do as an interim step. Um, and we probably and again the full the, the full Monty on that bridge repair was getting down into the stream and the footings and all this other kind of stuff that we will not be doing. So essentially, 
we were probably going to have to exceed the 100,000 in order to do the, the repair that we had already started looking at. Because the grant was issued two and a half years ago at that, at that price. And right. that, that was the labor market back then, and, and, you know, the, the contractor market. We're not going to be able to complete the $100,000 repair for $100,000 now. No, and so I guess that, that other question is then, can we can we use any balance of that hundred thousand dollars towards a redesign of the I'll, of I'll the bridge? And, and it'd be interesting to yeah. see. And if the answer is no, uh, what what is the cost from DeWolf to do that work uh, with the assumption that there isn't a dam? And can we reach some sort of agreement with the uh, friends of the Winooski that? we could pursue the the cost uh, or we could pursue paying for the cost of that design work if we get reimbursed for it down the future uh, down as part of their scoping because they're going to have to go through a design a design phase that'll be funded through their grants and our agreement is if, if we can get it covered we will if we have to pay for it we will to to apply for this bigger bundled thing, but if it falls apart, is there a way to recoup those design costs uh, out of their scoping project? Do they have an appetite for that conversation? Yeah, um, I, I have, you know, I've only had one conversation with Michelle so yeah. far, and it, this was the sort of, let's look at the big picture, and yeah. not the details. And um, Again, if, if they found another source for scoping and they, they can deal with that and we don't have to include that in our grant request for replacing the dam, then that would be fine. Right. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would assume that's kosher. Um, if it turns out that when I talk to emergency management, they say, well, we can include all those costs and then they don't have to do that, we'll figure that out. But this is all, I mean, their, their, target, their target date for removing the dam is 26. So there's, there's a long window before we get to the final details. So it'd be good to know, I guess, what the what what the cost would be for designing the, the new the new bridge, okay. just that we can. Well, I'll talk to Chris Temple and get an idea because yeah. he'll be you know the wolf will probably yeah. be our, our vendor to do that, and I'll say, so what, what's it going to cost to put the design together? Yeah. And set of plans. That'd be great. Yeah, I'll get that. So I guess, does that mean you guys are in favor of the short temporary interim and pursuing the combination grant? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll pursue that and keep you up to date. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Toby. Thank um, so we're a little behind schedule. Um, we've got uh, the dog protective order uh, and the curb cut. I see um, Buffy is on. We also have uh, uh, Lewis. Uh, yeah, do we, do we want to flip flop or just do it in the uh, in the order if that's okay. on the agenda? Yeah, I think, I think so. we can we can deal with the uh, protective order pretty quickly because basically we're just bringing you back what you discussed last time, um, and we just need your approval and your signature on okay. that, and then Bucky can deliver it to Elsa. That sounds because good. Because what she asked for, my understanding, Bucky can speak to it, but. Um, so we, we should be very close to my take. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions about the, the re, uh, revised agreement um, that was in the shared, shared folder? I guess I need to understand what's the revision. Um, is the training and the electronic? Yep, so rather than getting specific on the uh, on the electronic uh, confinement, we, we wanted to, it was GPS originally, and, and so we wanted to not make it so specific in the event there was a more effective or uh, economical option uh, for, uh, for the owner to pursue. Um, uh, and uh, the request from the DOB, uh, Owner, I think that's it. Are there any other? Well, it, it, it acknowledges that the latch has already been installed. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was the other thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then it's just a warning. That... Okay, correct. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Right. Looks it good. Looks like what we talked about. I believe her request was to request to remove the order if she did these things. And I believe we said we were going to do that. 
that's a problem. That's, uh, that's correct, yes. And then it would be contingent on having a hearing first. It would, yeah, we felt that it would be most appropriate to, to have a hearing yeah, and, and, and not to put that in this particular yeah. agreement. So Buffy could communicate that yeah. verbally. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's on, on, on the table if it were requested by the owner. Uh, anyway, so as written, um, and I have a motion to accept uh, and I guess authorize me to sign uh, the agreement so as we'll presented. Be. Bill, seconded, Anne? Sure. Great. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, so Buffy will have a signed version of that to uh, share with you and, uh, and, and bring to Elsa. Do you have any other uh, input on that? Uh, sounds fine to me. Great. Thank you for all your work on this, Buffy. I really appreciate it. Not a problem. Um, so the next item on, on the agenda uh, is the curb cut application. Uh, has uh, everybody uh, had the opportunity to review the documents? Mm -hmm. um, yes. yes. Does anybody have any questions about the application? No? I, I guess I, I'm surprised that there isn't, isn't a ditch on the side of the road that needs a culvert, but if we say we don't, we don't. No. I, mean, I was surprised by that too. It gets to the point where when is needed, it is who, who pays for that? So that would be... For every culvert's typically... That's the property the, owner. The property owner will... will Purchase it and we we'll, install it. We'll, uh, and we install it. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and we'll often order it for them and we'll reimburse them. Mm -hmm. So it looks like um, they're suggesting between Neil and Toby three contingencies, right? The, if the shade tree needs to be removed, there's a process to follow. They wouldn't um, move the soil in case there's invasive plants in there and um, there'll be some cutting back of trees to improve sight lines, although they're not specific about which ones. And I don't know whether we need to be, but those seem to be the three conditions that they're suggesting. Mm -hmm. Is that what I, everybody hearing that? I would move that. <laughs> so that's a, a motion uh, to uh, accept the, or approve the application for a curb cut as, uh, as applied for uh, with the conditions being uh, proposed uh, by Toby uh, and, uh, and Neil. Uh, except that I'm unclear about exactly what needs to be cut back. He just says there will needs to be some cutting back. How would we put that into the... Was that Neil's or Toby's? That's Toby. So, no, well, some, some of those are pretty obvious, and then I guess if there's something that's unclear after we get the obvious ones, we could have any help from the advice. Uh, well, but that's a sight line thing, so maybe that would be more, uh, you know, on the road commission, okay. road commissioner perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I'll have to sign off on it eventually. There you go. Okay. Right, so my understanding then, you know, relative to a couple of other things would be that, uh, you know, that cut, any cutting necessary to achieve uh, the necessary uh, sight lines and if any of that cutting uh, requires something qualifying as a shade tree that would be coordinated with with Neil. Right. Yeah. yeah, well what he wants is a 15 day warning. If it needs to be removed, it needs right. to be warned. Um, and I'm not sure what what does that mean that people can object? Yes. Well what is the shade tree preservation plan? So the yeah the shade tree preservation plan uh, is a uh, is a policy. Um, so it, it's a, it's a guiding document that kind of defines what the shade tree is and what the process is for uh, for evaluating the re removal of it. And is that where the fifteen day requirement comes? Yeah, that's correct. So Lewis, are you likely to move that that tree? Uh oh, um. So I've talked to Toby briefly about this. Um, I don't think there's going to be a need to remove a shade tree. And as for the cutting back, there's there's bushes on either side of where the curb cut's going to be that, that
that um, could make the line of sight bad for somebody coming down Martin. So I'm going to cut those back as well. And I don't think there'll be need to remove a, sh a shade tree. Thanks. Okay. Uh, if, there, there, if, if there is, if there is, I'm certainly happy to give plenty of If there is, I'm certainly happy to give plenty of yeah. okay. And Gary will approve the whatever cutting. The final, yeah. Uh, the final, yep. Yeah. Great. Uh, so we have a motion and a second, in, and there weren't any substantive uh, changes to the proposed application. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Yes, Barbara. Kari, do you have the, the, the approval to proceed to construct the curb cut in your paperwork on your side? Yes, I do. Okay, so you'll fill out all those conditions. Yep. Okay, because th this is not a sign. Someone just signed it. We need a quorum of you guys to sign. Thank you. You, you do need a quorum of us to sign? A, a form. It's a piece oh, a form. We need to <laughs> sign it. The curb cut permit. Um, so, uh, Lewis, for clarification, uh, please don't start construction until we've had an opportunity to distribute to you a, uh, a signed copy of, uh, of the application. Uh, but, but otherwise, no, no changes. It will we'll just work on getting you the signatures and send that over to you. I understood. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. All right. Getting hotter. Is it getting hotter in here? Oh yeah. Because I'm talking too much. Brain <laughs> power. You blame it on me. It's fine. Um, great. Um, so we are moving on to uh, the special election. Um, so there was a, uh, a draft warning um, uh, that was uh, posted in the share drive. Um, uh, to kind of identify uh, what what is involved in the, in the timing and logistics for that. Um, is that right, Deegan? Yeah, the, so the warning you all have to sign, you all are warning this election, and then Barbara has put together a ballot. So we have a ballot ready to go, but I didn't want to send it out into the world until you all had approved the warning. One addition to the warning uh, is an informational hearing, which will be talk a little more about um, it's not required to do an informational hearing. Our lawyer recommended it, and Mark, I don't know if I'm still saying who we made from the state, said it's not a bad idea, but we don't have to do a meeting. Uh, if we do a meeting, it has to be within 10 days of the election, so 10 or fewer days. 10 or fewer, do we? So 10 or, it has to be 10 or fewer days from the election? Uh, I'm confused why it's an informational hearing. Isn't it a more just meet the candidates meeting? Uh, what well, information is? Well, required? I guess that's that's what I would. Uh, that's I think what we have to dis discuss and whether or not we want to have one and how we would want to use it. Uh, it usually, this would be for like a if we were having a special election for yeah. like a bond vote and yeah. it was complicated. And we want to review it. I would say, um, you know, relative to the petition um, and. Um, uh, multiple applications. Last time uh, when we were making the appointments, we had kind of group interview. I think it would be worth just having, uh, given the given the time frame, uh, it would make sense to have an informational hearing. It would have been nice to include that as a select board meeting, I guess, so that it wouldn't have to be. Well, July twenty second is, but it's not yeah. ten days. No, it's days. not. But now that they were talking, I realized that because it's not a requirement. We could probably do it whenever we want to, oh. because we're not having to do it within the context of a bond vote or legislative change. Well, we plus do. people will be voting ahead of time, right? right. Yeah. Be, right. So the sooner the better, I think. So, so the, the idea was to do it at the start of your next meeting. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes, Barbara. So and just a reminder, I'm preparing a meet the candidates document to say I did when you guys were elected. So I have two of the buyers. The buyers and photos were due to me today, so I've got two of the four today, and I'm still waiting on the other two. And I need them tomorrow by tomorrow morning because I'm on vacation for the rest of in almost two weeks. So we're going to have two candidates for each seat? Two yes. for each seat, yep. Um, <clears throat> Uh-oh, now I'm losing my voice, so we might run out. Yeah, uh, cool. cool down. Uh, uh, 
do we need, do, do we have any liability for lack of uh, other turn calling it an informational hearing? Um, right. I don't think we're not it's not really, really it's not really a hearing. Yeah, uh, we're not required to have it, I think. And, and if the town just like, wants to host a meet the candidates yeah. and, and post that as a social event at the town hall, <laughs> that just doesn't even require your vote, I guess, to do that. The town clerk can do that. Yeah, they can do it, we can do it. Let's hope it's not 85 degrees to get that Or we could just invite the candidates to come in and make some statements yeah. and field <laughs> questions for, say, yeah. Well, we do that the we first half hour of our meeting or something. It's optional, of course. And, and not call it a hearing, just well, call it. call it an informational session uh, about the uh, upcoming yeah. special election on select board positions. Yeah. Does that sound, sound right for everybody? So are you still trying to include something about this on this official warning, notice, warning? I don't know no. that we would put it on the warning. Yeah. Yeah. So, is it, I think it's my understanding that now that the deadline has come and we know who the candidates are, Tegan's going to post a front porch form tomorrow that this ballot is now available. So people will be voting perhaps even before your July 22nd mm -hmm. meeting. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can wait and hear what you have, they have to say, or they can go ahead and vote if they already know who they want to vote for. It may be worth putting on the warning just to give people the, the opportunity, knowing that there's going to be a, some time dedicated to a dialogue. So we'll just we'll call it an uh, uh, informational session scheduled prior to uh, the next select board meeting and, and put that on the warning so that anybody who wants to hold casting a ballot in, until that opportunity, um, they'll, they'll have the ability to make that decision themselves. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the, the warning can go out. So that will have to be signed by you all, which means I might pop out of here and go tweak the language and print it out and bring it back. Okay. Because it needs to be warned by the 14th. By the 14th. That's the latest day of the if, if that works for you, Tegan, sorry for the extra running back and forth. All right. I, I it's schedule a lot of scrambling. It's going to happen. So. Uh, all right. Uh, well, uh, so we'll hold off a, a motion on that until Tegan comes back, I guess, and then we'll just sign it. As we don't well, we forget. Can, we can move it. Yeah. We, I'll, yeah. I'll move to sign the whatever Tegan brings back. We will be holding an informational hearing. Where information it's not session. an informational hearing. It's really so, sorry, the candidates the session. Candidate. Yeah. Yeah. Session. Yeah. Yeah. You all want to give me some wording so that I, we don't have to run back and forth. Uh, uh, how about uh, the public is invited to meet the candidates at 6 o'clock uh, at the beginning of the select board meeting on June 22nd. The candidates are also invited to show up. The, <laughs> Just saying. Or, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we think you could be here. Some time. would have to be, but uh, yes. All right. Uh, and then the only other question I have is this will also have to go to the newspaper. So we want this whole bit in the newspaper too, I'm assuming, about the public invited to meet the candidates. If it's part of the warning, I think it would, yeah, it would, that, that's what would go And out. they'll be able to zoom in, right? So that'll, yeah. yeah. And then okay. Is there a second to the motion and then we'll just sign it at the end of the meeting? All in favor? Aye. Uh, any other election questions, concerns? We can get our ballots now, is that right? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Oh, right. Well, not right now. You've printed them already? With no, they, we got just the they, they are designed and she has approved it. They're not printed. They're but they'll be printed tomorrow. Wow. You guys are efficient. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, people already started asking for primary ballots and a number of people said, oh, do you have the other ones yet? Mm -hmm. No, and they're like, okay, I'm going to wait. So I think there are a number of people who really want their ballots now. So the state primary ballots are, are available now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we've had them for like two weeks. Yeah, 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 as soon as yeah. we get them, people can vote. All right, cool. Yeah. Thank you, Tegan. Did you, you guys actually vote on this? You put the motion, did you vote? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank cool. you, Barbara. Outside and inside. Thanks. No. <laughs> uh, road grader bond. Uh, was everybody able to uh, review uh, Kari's uh, memo? Mm -hmm. 
So there's a series of documents there, we'll need a bunch of signatures, but it follows the same format as the Curtis Plum Dam on which three of you were involved in. It's the same attorney. So very much the same process you're being asked to adopt a resolution and that, that there's loan agreement and things. Just note that we won't know the final interest rate until closing. Yeah. All right. I'll move we adopt the resolution and sign the documents. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Excellent. Great. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Perry. So we're already using it. <laughs> 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 really nice. It's just nice of them to give us something that I didn't pay for yet. <laughs> um, Kari, you want to uh, run through uh, the treasurer report? Oh, oh I'm sorry. No, Curtis Bond. Curtis Bond. Yeah, Jamie, you should definitely do that. Unless you want Kari to do it, that seems a little unfair. <laughs> I think. We're not accepting. Right. Permission. We decided, Kari and I decided to wait because um, we're still doing the, we want to accept the donation once in the exact amount that's going to come instead of doing it piecemeal. So we just have more paperwork and cash flow wise, Kari said that was totally fine. Um, and then the current thought, the final $200,000 that's a loan, the CPA has to start paying interest on as soon as the money is, the check is written. Mm -hmm. And so Kari and I were thinking that they basically said they need 72 hours notice to get us the check. And so if cash flow wise, it doesn't matter to us if we get that final piece now versus the end of August or whenever the bills start coming due, um, we see no reason not to postpone that final two hundred thousand down the road. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense to everybody. So, um, the CPA is some interest. so the only other well, oh, did, oh, sorry. No. Can I ask a yeah. question on that quick? Uh, so the the dam needs to be complete substantively completed right by October. Yeah. Um, uh, so just kind of anticipate anticipating any perception that um, they were kind of protecting the, the town's outside exposure on, on absorbing any of that cost and it not working out, et cetera, et cetera, would it be worth considering, you know, putting some sort of deadline on, on when we would expect the CPA to, uh, to start that, you know, so. Well, uh, the, so there's the donations, the, the fundraising that's already happened. Right. I think we can definitely accept that in two weeks yeah. and use that to pay the expenses. We're going to start to see, I would expect, by the next meeting. Right. Some, uh, some bills. You know, some, yeah. Uh, uh, requisition. So, um, and then the 200000 I don't, I don't know. I don't have a strong opinion about that. We are, are earning interest on the bond proceeds that are sitting nice. in a bank account. So I'll take your point, you know, it's like mm -hmm. right. whose interest? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and yeah, so I'm yeah. I'm wondering if we put you know put a deadline on, on when we accept donations and then another deadline on, on when the CPA would would agree to um, yeah. to, to yeah. finalize that CPA second one and call yeah. you know call it something like August or, First meeting, fifteenth or something like yeah. that, um, and seems, then a, a receipt yeah. of funds. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I need to uh, step out of my select board role and take my Robinson Selma hat on just for a second. And you talked about dewatering, and I, from the Robinson Selma side, we need to have some type of assurance that someone's going to be checking on things downstream. The effect not only the Beaver Dam, but on the uh, Robinson Selma thing. Um, the flood last year didn't compromise the dam, but it moved, it moved the mill site because things don't close the way they used to. <laughs> so we just want to make sure that, that whatever is happening upstream doesn't cause water to mm -hmm. top the dam. That's, so we need some kind of mitigation for that. Okay, back in slow yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely 
be in touch then once it starts. But as I said earlier, what they told me is that it won't be a significant increase in water flow. Although we've had, you know, the pond's higher now than it, it was when we had these discussions. Yeah. Um, so it might be. I think when the dewatering starts, it'll be important within 24 hours or something and then I'll go right. to, to monitor yeah. what's going on. Yeah, for sure. Because it can probably taper back if they need to. Yeah. Because you got a big storm in the middle of that, let's say. Right. You certainly wouldn't want to stop dewatering while you let the water the rest right. of the town get level. Right. Um, the, the first dewatering will just be the cove, um, which is basically this dam side of the dock <laughs> right. over to the point, yep. um, which he thought would only take you know, it'd be 24 hours or right. so with a pump running. Um, okay. Yeah. My understanding is that now under construction, there's a liability policy on the on the part of the contractors. So if there were damage downstream relative to their activity, it would be on, would be on their insurance. Um, <coughs> but I, you know, I always good to take preventative. Yeah. Cautions early, um, so that that should be on their radar bill <laughs> because yeah. they're they're their they're liability. they're liable for uh, impacts downstream. I guess I'd, yeah, I'd like somebody to say that. Yeah, yeah, I will be sure to have that conversation with them. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, so we're uh, we're not taking any specific so actions at this time uh, about the donations, other than I think so. Setting a deadline. The next meeting. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah, and no other major updates except that they're supposed to be um, in the water a week from today. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> yep. I just want to say congratulations on a wonderful ribbon cutting ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. it was very maple corner. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> And well attended. It's, it uh, I yeah, think it exceeded your expectations, yeah, did it not? It did. Uh, it, was it, was a, it was a really, good gathering. It was a great gathering. I thought all the speakers did well at keeping their, mm -hmm. <laughs> keeping it short. That's always the fear. <laughs> you have three minutes, not 15. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought it went very well. Well, thanks, Jamie. Uh, financial report? Yeah, so the documents are in there, they're unaudited year-end, and pretty pleased with how things turned out. You know, we had some significant challenges this year, one on the course issue, you know, ongoing, and then the gravel budget, which was, we were over budget in January, um, in so many month seasons. So all in all, we did pretty well. On the revenue side, we exceeded our budget projections, both general government and highway. So that was good, especially in terms of delinquent tax, I think we really did, did well. And then remember that the town administrator position was um, essentially the, that was budgeted in the highway department. Um, and then the decision was made in the fall to switch that over to general government. And that sort of explains why there was a surplus in the highway department's budget specifically. And um, as a result of that uh, vote that was taken at town meeting, that surplus went into the highway capital equipment fund. And so that because that surplus is going forward, that's where we end up. So um, there's that, and then, you know, feeling pretty good about our cash position because mm -hmm. we've continued to get the FEMA reimbursements. Um, we got another one today, yeah. and, um, and we're still expecting, we're about halfway through that process, so that's good. Um, and then um, it's just gonna be interesting when we start getting these dam construction requisitions, we've got the bond, we've got these other funds coming in. But I'm not really clear on what the pacing of those requisitions are going to be relative to the input. So it's just, it's going to be interesting. But it doesn't feel nearly as tight as it did two months ago. So we're all pretty good. Um, my focus this week is really getting ready for the audit, which is going to be on Monday and Tuesday. We are going to close the office Monday and Tuesday for that field of work and just take over the like, town office. Questions? So we're seventy thousand in the hole. 
But and do you think the FEMA reimbursements will cover that as we get? So, so FEMA is essentially going to make us whole. Um, yeah. You know what we're expecting is pretty close to 100% reimbursement, which uh, you know based on the legislature's it was a mid-session budget mm -hmm. adjustment. Mm -hmm. They they said that they were going to so the state's portion was going to be larger than we expected. Plus there was some grant money to bring it pretty close to 100%. So the whole 1.4 million is going to is going to be replaced in. In terms of our cash, it doesn't impact that seventy thousand dollar loss, but we started the year with a pretty healthy fund balance. I understand, so we are replenishing that. But but, but a lot of the FEMA is paying for for the road crew salaries that we would have been paying for That's anyway. True. So um, That's true, and I don't have that number at my uh, my fingertips, but a good portion of what our road crew earned last summer. Is going to be a reimburse, and so that that in a sense does help offset that seventy, if not. Because it, I, I would have to I would have to go in and compute that, but I, I, I have so don't project. know yet. Okay. But it, it it is a significant amount because that was their focus, right, from mid July up to yeah. When I when I got here, they were still working on it somewhat. Yeah. I think they were starting to transition. <coughs> The, the lion's share of those reimbursements are contractor, as to your aware. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I think we were very fortunate to have those contractors lined up and, and mobilized right away, because there are towns that are still trying to get repair work done. Uh, they just didn't do this thing. Hmm. So, Any other questions on the financial reform? No. Thanks, Karen. Okay. Uh, the memos for the compensation and estimated property tax are those separate, or do you want to handle those now? Oh, uh, so well, do you want to do town clerk report? I don't know if we've covered everything. Well, oh, I wasn't sure if you were going to do that in your report or if you oh, were part of it. But yeah, yeah, we yeah, it could be anywhere. I, you know, that the, the compensation adjustments for the beginning of the fiscal year—that's just an FYI. Mm -hmm. All of that was decided by our labor contract or in the budget. Um, so that's just an FYI. Okay. Uh, Tegan, you have anything uh, to report uh, other than the signatures that you so need been, now? Uh, there's been a lot of reporting lately, a lot of like the state beats. They're very hot right now. Um, <laughs> other than that, we did have a visit today. Karen, did you talk about this? from Nimrick, mm -hmm. uh, and he mentioned how the reappraisal was coming, because they're going to be starting soon. They're the ones who will contact us when they're ready to get started. Um, and he he was just working out logistics, because he said sometimes, especially in the first year, or first six months, or about the early part stages of the reappraisal, it'll probably just be one or two people who could easily work in the town office. But he says... He has 20 people on his staff. If at any point he feels like he needs 20 people, he's going to bring 20 people. Where else could he work? How else could he work? He needs access to Nimrick to the, the data that we have. Uh, and so we talked about maybe providing him with a VPN, which is what we use to access the software, sort of the connection to our virtual desktop, I suppose we think about it. Uh, the other thing he said, well, we could just put you all on the cloud. And there's a lot to that that we still need to learn about, but it's it's an idea that keeps getting talked about, so it's an idea you'll see soon. We, it, he was on his way home from somewhere else and just brought it up to us, and we didn't really have time to hash it out, but it is something that we'll need to figure out either, A, are we going to go on the cloud, or B, how are we going to accommodate 2 to 10 to 20 appraisers doing their work over the next two years. Um, so that's just a little piece of information to be looking Anything else? The grand list was formally lodged today. It's done. We signed all the things, and that was pretty exciting. That that, so that helps probably be able to move forward with all the taxes and everything. 
Yeah, we'll be setting tax rate, what, next? Two next, weeks. In yeah. two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So that, and that was uh, one of the things I, you know, wanted to preview. Just, mm -hmm. then I wasn't really able to dig into it because I've been so busy, but I did provide that one pager from the town report that, um, you know, the voters saw in sort of estimating what will be the tax, uh, the, the implications of approving the town budget and, and all that. So the, the, the big variables there are the final education tax. Since, since the voters approved everything, you know, the budget as proposed, the, those, those budgetary numbers are, are pretty solid. Um, but the big variables were the education tax, and how that finally ended up, and the, the grant list, which we have today. So over the next two weeks, I'm going to be working on that. And, you know, giving you that recommendation. But I just wanted to, you know, sort of preview that and make, make sure you're aware of what are the key variables. Um, so you be thinking about that. So, you know, it's a big action. It's one of the bigger ones. Yeah. Did I see um, the Times Argus report that was kind of a deep, deep initial debriefing of the uh, of the education tax and how that? Yeah, I don't know how informative that really was, but. The, the takeaway was that there were some really big numbers in there, or at least increases, and, and the, uh, the estimated increases to Calus in particular uh, relative to the uh, school budgets that were passed were, were on the low side of middle uh, relative to what everybody else was seeing. Uh, in the district. In the district. Yeah. It's, yes. But not 14 <laughs> percent, yeah. or 21 percent. When we get reappraised, everything will shift. Right. Everything so. will shift again. Interesting. All right. Barbara, did I miss anything? Did I miss anything? Um, the cloud conversation uh, with Nimrick, I, I think we had talked about this, or at least I vaguely recall some kind of anecdotal feedback on why they're could be some hiccups with uh, with a cloud-based NIMRIC. Uh, and Honestly, the, the first thing that had us hesitate is he said, it's only $10 per user per month. And we calculated with Barbara, Kari, me, Zoning, and Listers, and Sandra, that's 60 bucks a month right. in perpetuity, which is a big chunk of change that he seemed to think was a steal. And maybe it is, but it's not budgeted. It's not budgeted, and it's, we, he hasn't proven to us that we need it. In fact, I will say anecdotally, my husband is in there and he said, so the only thing it sounded like in that conversation is he wants you to do it because it makes his job easier. Yeah. And I was like, that's kind of how it felt, but you know, he, it was not a thorough presentation. So we would definitely pursue a more balanced conversation if we can. Yeah. We make any decisions or even bring any recommendations. To you. And I, I know with other platforms like that, that are that substantial and they go, when they go cloud-based, they're It'd be good to like get some feedback from from other town clerks and offices yeah, sure. that have gone cloud based because they can be they can be a, a real headache yeah. um, if there's yeah. connectivity issues uh, or disruptions. Um, I guess the other thing to consider is that that may change the calculus for RV technologies and server replacement mm -hmm. considerations. So mm -hmm. even if there's a short-term increase in carrying costs and we can get confident you know reassurances that connectivity issues won't necessarily be a problem uh and and then realize maybe some savings on the server side because we might be able to go to more of a virtual server and i'm due um, for an annual check-in with rudin next month so yeah. that will be part of the conversation Awesome. Thanks. One, one thing you said that I hadn't heard before was that within two years it'll be required. Like the that, whole that, company is going that route. I mean, that might be part of the sales pitch, but. That was something else that. someone else from Nimrick had said when Barbara and I had a box question. They said, well, everyone's going to be there eventually. So they all seem to think. Yeah, subscription model is universally great for everybody yeah. who's receiving their <laughs> money. I think. Exactly. Seeing that. Well, we don't have any complaints about how it's working now. Now that we have CD Fiber, I don't, I don't, haven't heard any complaints from you all. Everything is great for me, so that's that's another factor. Yeah, I guess that would be another one. Uh, what the scalability of remote access is uh, for for them 
you know, as as informed by RB now that we have better better connectivity. Um, and I guess that they're, are they going to be making any edits to uh, to Nimric at all, or any changes, or are they just pulling? They're just pulling data uh, for their reporting. Oh, uh, the uh, reappraisal. Yeah. They said they were just pulling it into the cloud and then on their tablets, and then they put it back. Yeah. Hmm. That'd be another good good question for for RB because um, there like, there could be like data corruption issues with remote access that would be less corruptible with cloud access. Is Beijing Thai fully up and running, or is that still due? There are no hometown clerk requirements for BT Thai, but I know that the listers are using it. OK, and they're fully up and running. That, that's checked off the list. I believe so. <laughs> Is there any anything else to kind of update on? So a mess of documents to sign. Just a mess of documents to sign. Mm -hmm. And that CAI, that we're, so we're, it sounds like oh. we're getting some. So we have a draft the, of, um, of the new site available. Um, I found it to be buggy. I can't click on a parcel and access the data. Mm -hmm. um, you can search and find. Have you, have you, is that your experience? I only used it that one day last week, yeah. but that was the same experience. If I click, nothing happens. So I, I didn't think it was worth sharing with you yet, but once it is, then, then mm -hmm. we'll share. You have to you know, set up a password, log in password. They're happy to do that, but I just didn't think it was worth your time yet. Um, but we're making progress. It did look pretty neat once you got into somebody. You could search by name or parcel or address, and once you got in there, there was a nice amount of data already in there, so that was cool. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Is there in the contract like a guarantee for satisfaction or we get our money back type thing? Or? I don't know if all that. I'm not sure they want us to be pleased. Should have read that one closer. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, well, the, I guess the reason I was, uh, I was asking is um, because we have other GIS uh, resources and before we hand those off or not subscribe to them, yeah, uh, it'd be good to have maybe like Sarah come in just to like. Yeah. She has so much experience with that, but like just to have her like do some real tire kicking uh, yeah. yes. before we say, yeah, we're happy and thanks for this thing. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Anyway, uh, great. Can we entertain a motion to adjourn? Is there anything on the shed thing? Uh, there is not anything to report at the moment. Okay. Would anybody else love to adjourn? Uh, Bill made a motion, a motion? to I'll second loving to adjourn. And I'll, <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. That was a